you know, we have seen the biggest cuts coming in in the U.S. markets in a very long time. We have not seen about 5%, 3% cuts coming in as far as the NASDAQ and the S&P is concerned for a long time. So we thought of getting you a big global voice, uh, an eminent uh, value investor, Bill Nigren of Oakmark Funds, uh, joins us today all the way from uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, Mr. Nigren, uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, now, you've been a value investor for a very long time, manage about $50 billion. Uh, talk to us about how are you analyzing the current market environment on risk-reward basis. Uh, many are saying that the numbers are not really adding up. It's just liquidity which is fueling the markets. Uh, fundamentals are not really in the same great shape. Uh, how are you looking at the overall uh, environment right now? Well, I think the market in the United States has been a very bimodal market where you've had some high growth stocks that have performed incredibly well. They've seen their PE ratios go from maybe 25, 30 times earnings up to now 75 to 100 times earnings. And that's been the part of the market the public has been really excited about. That's not really what we're invested in at Oakmark Funds. We're invested in more traditional businesses, banks, consumer non-durables, industrial companies, and those stocks still have multiples that are barely into the double digits. Uh, some of the banks still selling at uh, high single-digit PEs, and a lot of companies selling uh, at multiples in the teens. We think that part of the market is very attractive, not only on a, uh, a relative basis compared to interest rates, uh, but also on an absolute basis that we think we'll earn uh, good returns relative to inflation with a portfolio of those stocks at low PE multiples. Right, uh, Bill, you know, uh, the U.S. Uh, markets have seen unprecedented rally mainly backed by the tech stocks, the FANG stocks, and the world's fascination with uh, U.S. technology stocks has been unprecedented in the last few weeks and months. Now, of course, some some minor cracks seem to be emerging there. What are you making of this, uh, you know, big rally where money seem to be getting concentrated towards uh, technology stocks in U.S. as if no other category of stocks exist? What are your thoughts there? I mean, I think a lot of the technology equipment companies that sell at PE multiples from 50 to 100 times earnings are very expensive relative to their underlying fundamental value. You know, it's funny to me, people call Netflix a technology company. We think of it as a media company. We analyze it the same way we analyzed cable TV companies when Oakmark Fund first started in the early 1990s. Uh, cable TV companies lost money. They had negative book value per share. But we saw an active private market where uh, other companies wanted to buy cable subscribers at about $1,000 a subscriber. We figured out that that math made sense based on the cash flow that the companies generated, but that the depreciation they were charging, the customer acquisition costs made uh, gap income turn negative, even though the company was adding substantial value. When we saw AT&T purchase Time Warner, uh, we think AT&T had an implied value for HBO that was a little over $1,000 a subscriber. We think that, uh, came to like a low teens multiple of EBITDA. So it economically made sense to buy a mature uh, video company at $1,000 a subscriber. Netflix spends much more on programming than HBO does. Uh, we think the idea that a Netflix subscriber is worth $1,000 also makes sense. And if you think in very broad terms, uh, Netflix has a market capitalization of something around $200 billion. They add something like 25 million subscribers a year. If those subscribers are worth $1,000, uh, it's selling at about eight times the value that it's adding. So to us, despite Netflix not earning much money today, uh, it is very much still a value stock. Mr. Nigrin, uh, you've recently made comments that, uh, you know, traditional uh, manner of valuing companies and stocks, be it price to uh, earnings, price to book, etc., 
may not really apply in entirety in the current environment. The world has changed a whole lot. And many other, you'll have, one, one will have to really look at companies in a different manner. Uh, talk to us, what did you really mean by that and how one should really go about valuing stocks now? Well, I think we've, we've all known that gap accounting uh, is only an approximation of how much value a company is creating in a given year. Uh, you, know, you think of some of the expenses that get, amor that get uh, expensed immediately under gap accounting, things like advertising expense, where the benefit might actually last for multiple years, but the expense goes through the income statement in one year. Uh, that kind of created the, the brand value that uh, Buffett was early to capitalize on in the early 1980s. Uh, and that started the move of value investors away from book value as the be all and end all. You know, in, a, in a heavy asset business, uh, gap accounting does a reasonably good job. But when you start having important assets that you can't touch and feel, gap accounting doesn't do so well with them. We think there are a lot of companies today that whether it's customer acquisition cost or uh, research and development expenditures, uh, investing in a sales force ahead of the value that that creates. A company like Alphabet investing in the other bets area that's actually losing money, that's reducing their reported income. We think you have to make adjustments to gap income to get a better, uh, a better estimate of how much value a company is creating and uh, kind of alter the PE ratio a little bit. And it, this isn't all in the direction of making companies look cheaper. Uh, if you look at some of the consumer products companies, packaged good companies that have dramatically cut back on their R&D, they've cut back on advertising, they're still getting the benefit of prior spending, but now that expense is no longer going through the income statement. So we, sent, we think some of those companies are actually over-reporting income today uh, because gap accounting is allowing them to experience the benefits of their historical spend on R&D and advertising. Mr. Nigren, you've always believed that uh, accounting actually is the language of business. Uh, so when you really analyze companies, great managements, great companies which can outperform the market over decades because that's what your uh, holding horizon is five to seven year and beyond, what exactly do you look for? How do you really spot a company which can outperform the frontline benchmarks over the long term? So at Oakmark, we're looking for three things when we purchase a company. We try to estimate the business value. And to us, that's how much could somebody pay if they were buying the entire business and still earn an adequate return on their investment. And then we'll only purchase that stock if we can get it at a significant discount to that number. And to, to develop our forecast for what a business is worth, we're looking out five to seven years. So we have a much longer time horizon than the average investor does, uh, especially in the United States today. You know, stocks are moving based on stock splits or announcements of quarterly earnings. That doesn't matter much to us at Oakmark unless it alters uh, our estimate of what a company will be worth five to seven years down the road. We look for companies that are growing their values at least as fast as the S&P 500. And then most importantly, we're looking for managements that are aligned with the outside shareholder. We want them to think they're, they're only doing their job if they are maximizing the long-term per share value of the companies. So when we interview the management teams that we are considering investing in, we're trying to understand what motivates them, what types of goals they've set for themselves and their organization, and ask questions about how they intend to invest free cash flow. We want to make sure the entire focus is on maximizing per share value. There are a lot of companies that talk about growing the business, growing the scale of the company they manage, uh, that obviously makes a CEO job more valuable, but depending on how they do it, it might not benefit the shareholders. Like if, if you grow by uh, making lots of acquisitions and overpaying for them, issuing stock that was undervalued, you might actually decrease per share value by growing. 
we want to make sure that managements use the same types of measuring sticks that we do that focus on growing per share value over time. Mr. Nigren, you know, uh, the, you, there's, there's, there's a phenomenon which is being seen globally and which is the first time traders, investors, be it, uh, you know, Robinhood invest traders uh, in the US or back home in India too, all the low cost brokerages are actually seeing a massive surge in new account addition. Clearly shows that first time entrants are coming to the market. Uh, what would your advi advice be to these new entrants in the market be? whether they are traders or investors, you've seen uh, the market for long enough. Uh, I'm sure they will be able to learn a lot from your rich experience. What would your observation and uh, advice be to them? And in fact, uh, you know, uh, in drawing rooms, we are being discussed that gambling versus trading and investing and that kind of conversations also happening. So what would your reading be? Sure. Back when I was in school, uh, I became fascinated with the stock market and the analogy to gambling. And I think the important difference is if you look at casino gambling or horse racing, uh, sports gambling, there's no way to earn a positive expected return. The, the casino always wins. The, the racetrack always wins. Uh, the house always wins that's taking uh, sports bets. But in the stock market, the expected return for the average investor is positive. And the longer you stretch out your time horizon, the more important that advantage is. And that's why we call it investing, because if, if you put your capital to work and you have patience over time, and you're invested in a growing global economy, you're likely to come out ahead of where you started. I think the problem with you know, what we're seeing today, kind of a resurgence of day trading. And this is again, reminiscent of what we went through in 1998, 1999, where when the stock market was going up, it just looked so easy. And pe you had people quitting their jobs because they were making so much money day trading. Uh, it didn't end well. Uh, it, it never does. Any, anything other than basing investment decisions on long-term business fundamentals eventually is destined to fail. But I think the reason it's so popular right now, uh, most of the world uh, doesn't have as much sports going on as, as they uh, did pre-pandemic. Uh, so sports gambling isn't an outlet. You've got a lot of people working from home, so they have more freedom uh, with their time during the business day. And uh, they're, they're looking at the stock market for entertainment value. We think, we think that's dangerous. And uh, you know, it's, it's worked well for people since work from home started in March. The s and is up 50%. So almost anybody who's been doing this has been making money. And the, the longer that goes on, the smarter they think they are. We think that's when it's becoming very, very dangerous. All right, uh, Mr. Nigren, we'll let you go on that one. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really value uh, your joining us uh, on the show today. That was a noted and very eminent value investor, uh, Mr. Bill Nigren of Oakmark Funds. He manages close to $49 billion uh, in assets and have been, uh, you know, uh, value investing is what he's been practicing for almost three decades now.